Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture. Basically we're covering some aspects of genetics today. The first part will go into Mendel and the gene, which is the general kind of basic introduction of genetics. And then the second part will focus on DNA and the gene, which is the chapter and information that goes into the details of DNA replication, as well as DNA repair. Now, as we go through these slides, please make sure to take careful notes on each slide as if you were sitting in the classroom, especially making sure to write down any definitions of bolded or colorful terminology, as well as the answer to any of the questions that you saw on your PDF version of the slides. If at any point you have any questions or concerns, please contact me in the Remind app. Now, the first thing I want to go over is, well, what exactly is genetics? When we talk about genetics, which is one of my favorite topics in the sciences, we're basically covering the study of heredity and variation. So how you inherit certain genes and thus how you inherit certain traits from your parents. Now, when we talk about genetics and we go way back, we refer to the father of genetics as Gregor Mendel. What Mendel did was he studied inheritance by using pea plants, and he would basically look at certain traits, such as flower colors, the color of the pea pods, the textures of the peas themselves, and things like plant height, such as tall versus short, to kind of see how the parental plant would then pass on these traits to the offspring. And keep in mind, at this point, people did not know the terms genes or DNA. He was simply looking at the visuals in front of him and trying to get a better understanding. Then later on, through studying and kind of analyzing his work, other scientists were able to discover the existence of genes. And for genes, I want you to make sure that you write down the definition of a gene is that it's the unit of inheritance, meaning it's what gets passed on to offspring. And each of the genes of DNA is found in pairs because you are inheriting from two parents, okay? These pairs then separate during gamete formation. And I want you to circle the term gamete, okay? Circle that term there. And make note that your gametes are your sex cells. So either a sperm or an egg cell, okay? So when you produce sperm or an egg cell to pass on to your offspring, your offspring are getting one copy of each of your genes. They are then getting a second copy from their other parent, okay? Now, when you have these pairs of genes, you basically end up with alternate forms of them. So for instance, when we talk about plant height, you can have plant height that's either tall or short. You can have pea color that's either yellow or a green pea pod from that plant, okay? So those alternate forms of genes are called alleles. And a little trick that I use is usually undering the AL of alleles and underlining the AL of alternate, okay? To make sure that you know that alleles are alternate forms of genes. Meaning, for instance, if you're looking at the gene for height of the plant, the alleles would be the tall version and the short version, okay? Which the way we would write those alleles are capital T versus lowercase t, okay? We'll go more into detail in the coming slides. Now, before we get into the details of alleles, I wanna introduce you to two terms we use a lot in genetics. The first one is genotype. If I ever ask you about a genotype, I'm asking you about the genes for a particular trait, meaning that it should be written as the letters for the alleles of that gene. And remember, we talked about alleles in the last slide. That's simply the alternative or alternate 
forms of a gene. We're going to go more into detail in the next slide as well. So genotypes are the gene or allele letters for a trait, the genes that actually make up that particular trait for that organism. Whereas the phenotype is what you physically see. Okay, so if these letters here were representing alleles for the plant height, the phenotype we would see is tall. You would see a tall plant in front of you. And when we talk about plant height, that term would be the trait that we're looking at. Okay, so in the figures here, you can see that the genotype is the genetics or the genes and alleles that actually code for the phenotype that you see. In this figure here, you're looking at fruit flies, you're looking at their wings, and so the genotype would be the alleles, those letters that you see for the genes making up um, that that trait that we're going to be looking at and then the phenotype would be are you seeing long normal wings or are you seeing wrinkled wings okay and the trait would be wing type okay so don't get these terms mixed up another example that students like to use is eye color so the trait would be eye color if you are seeing blue eyes and the phenotype is blue eyes or blue. The genotype would then be the alleles making that up. So for instance, lowercase b, lowercase b, okay? So eye color is the trait, phenotype is blue eyes or brown eyes or green eyes, whatever color you're seeing. And then genotype are the letters of the alleles making up that gene. Okay, that trait. And the other terms that you'll see with that in a minute are homozygous or heterozygous. Those are genotype terms. So again, going more into detail with this terminology, let's focus on alleles. Like I said, alleles are the alternate forms of genes at the same location on a chromosome. Okay, so here you have homologous chromosomes, meaning your pair of chromosomes. And you can have an allele for flower color on this chromosome, and then a different allele for flower color on this chromosome. So for instance, if it was for eye color, you can have the allele that produces blue eyes on one chromosome, but then the matching chromosome has the allele that produces brown eyes, okay? Now, when we talk about genotypes, again, the terms that you might see are homozygous versus heterozygous genotypes. Homozygous simply means that at that location, you would have two of the same alleles for that particular trait. So for instance, when we're talking about plant height, you are homozygous for that trait if you have two capital letter dominant alleles for tall height, or you're homozygous if you have two lowercase allele letters for short height. You would be heterozygous, hetero meaning different, if your alleles for that trait look different. One is a capital T, for instance, one is a lowercase t, okay? Now, when you see capital versus lower cases, the reason you're seeing that is because alleles can either be dominant or recessive, okay? A dominant allele, we write with a capital letter. So in the case of plant height, dominant is the capital T, which produces a tall appearance, okay? That dominant allele means that all you need is one dominant and you automatically will see that physical trait, okay? So in this case, the genotype here with two capital T's or the genotype here with a capital and a lowercase t, both of those plants will look tall because they both have a dominant capital T. Whereas lowercase allele letters are for the recessive 
allele. And recessive alleles are masked by their dominant partner. Okay, the only way you can see a recessive trait is if there is no dominant allele present. So please make sure you write that down. The only time you see recessive, you see it with your own eyes, for instance, blue eye color, the only time you see that is if there is no dominant allele for that trait, okay? Because the moment you have even one dominant allele, it masks the recessive trait, meaning you only see the dominant trait. So let's get back to Gregor Mendel. What Mendel did was he used garden peas as a model organism. And I want you to circle that term because that's very important in the sciences. Whenever we say model organism, this means an organism that we use in our research to help demonstrate scientific principles, okay? Now, model organisms can be peas or pea plants like Mendel used, or in the modern day, model organisms include bacteria, yeast, mice, uh, various other organisms like Drosophila that you might use once you take your genetics class. Any organism that we can study in our experiments and a lot of times then relate what we see to human scientific principles as well. Now, why exactly did Mendel choose the garden peas? Well, why do we choose any model organism? First off, it was polymorphic. Okay, poly means many, and morphic means the forms that you're seeing. So polymorphic means that the garden peas had many different forms. So for instance, there's the tall version and the short version that you can see without any special technology. Just looking at a pea plant, you can see the height. You can see the different colors of the flowers or the different colors of the pea pods, the wrinkly versus smooth texture of the round little peas. Okay, so polymorphic means that there are many forms that you can see with your eyes. You don't need any extra technology. When we choose model organisms, we also want to choose something that's easy to handle, not very dangerous, small, and cheap. Okay, all of these apply to garden peas. Now, how exactly was it used? Well, if you look at pea plants, or a lot of flowering plants, normally what they do is they self-fertilize or self-pollinate, meaning they have male organs and female organs, and the male organ will produce pollen that then fertilizes the female organ that receives the pollen. Instead, what Mendel did was he removed the male organ of the pea plants, the flowers that he was working with, and he used a brush to pollinate them or fertilize them with whatever pollen he wanted to. Okay, so self-fertilization means the flower has the male, the female parts, and the male part will put the pollen to the female part. Cross-pollination means the male part has been removed, and Mendel used a brush to put whichever pollen he wanted into that particular flower. Now to study inheritance, Mendel did a few different types of crosses. The first one that I want you to know is the monohybrid cross. Now like the name suggests, mono means single. So in the monohybrid cross, you're looking at the inheritance of a single trait, such as the texture of the uh, pea seeds, okay? Looking at a single trait, when you are looking at that single trait, each organism you will write with two alleles, okay? So for each trait, you have two alleles, one you inherited from mom, one you inherited from dad. In this cross, you look at three generations, and we're going to draw this out in a minute. 
you look at the P1, the F1, and the F2. P1 stands for parental one, F1 is filial one, which stands for the offspring of P1, and then when you cross those F1 offspring together, you then make the F2, which is the second set of offspring. And ultimately, you can predict inheritance by drawing out Punnett squares. And so what you see here is Punnett square, and we're going to draw them on the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to switch to pen mode to kind of draw this out for you. So in this model hybrid cross, what we're going to look at is P seed color. Okay, so P seed color. That is the trait. Okay, that's the trait that we're looking at. Our P1, which is the parental generation, Okay, there'll be the first parent and the second parent, and there'll be homozygous stock. Okay, so in this case, parent one will be two capital Y's, okay, and parent two will be two lowercase Y's. Capital Y, sorry. Capital Y is dominant. Let me just erase that. So capital Y is dominant. That leads to yellow color. Okay, whereas lowercase y is recessive. That leads to green color. Notice that we take the letter of the dominant trait. Okay, and you can write dominant versus recessive there. So this first parent would have yellow seeds, and the second parent would be green recessive. When you cross those, each parent gives one allele for that trait, okay, to their offspring. Each parent only has one type of allele because they're homozygous. So whether it gives the first allele or the second, either way, the yellow parent is passing on a capital Y, and either way, the green parent has to pass on a lowercase y. And that will be what the F1 offspring look like. Now notice, each organism has two alleles. In this case, this F1 is heterozygous. It has one tall, oh, sorry, one capital, one lowercase allele. Okay, two different alleles means it is homozygous which we also call a hybrid, okay, hybrid. It has two different alleles. Now, what will this organism look like? Well, since you see a dominant capital letter, it will look like whatever is the dominant capital letter color. So all of these will look yellow, okay? So all of them will look yellow. Now, when you cross the F1 to make F2, you make a Punnett square to figure out what the inheritance will look like to make the S2. So what you do is you put an F1 parent on each side, okay? You put one allele in each spot. So let's say parent one, if it's F1, it has one capital letter and one lowercase letter. The other parent, parent two, has the same alleles. So you do one capital letter, one lowercase letter. Everything in here now, in the boxes, those are the F2, okay? And what you do for each box, you match the alleles from the two parents. So for this first F2 organism, they inherited a capital allele from parent one and a capital allele from parent two. We always write the capital alleles first when you're writing out genotypes. So this next square, you have a capital Y from here and you have the lowercase y from here. 
this next square, you have a capital Y from parent 1, and you have a lowercase y from parent 2. And the last square is two lowercase y's. So when you write out what the F2 offspring are, notice that one box is offspring that's fully capital letters. You have two boxes that have a capital and a lowercase genotype. And you have one box that's just lowercase y's. So the F2 generation, when we look at all these F2, that first one would look yellow, and so would those other two, because all of these squares here have at least one capital letter. And as soon as you have that capital letter, it looks yellow, okay? Only this little guy here will look green. Okay. Now, when we talk about genotype and phenotype ratios from those offspring, you have four offspring in this box. Okay. Four different offspring. For the genotypes, genotypes, genotype ratio of the F2, notice this is one genotype homozygous dominant, okay? So you have one homozygous dominant genotype. You have two heterozygous genotypes. And you have one homozygous recessive. Okay, so I'm only writing the letters, but please also write that the first one is homozygous dominant. You then have two heterozygous genotypes, and you have one homozygous recessive. Then for the phenotypes, for the phenotypes, you notice three of the offspring look yellow, and only one looks recessive green. So for the phenotypes, you have three yellow or dominant to the one green. So when you have a monohybrid cross of two heterozygous organisms, okay, two heterozygous organisms, and I just caught that I made a mistake earlier when I was writing it out, that should be heterozygous organisms. Okay, I apologize for that confusion. Um, when you have a cross of two heterozygous organisms in a monohybrid cross, the F2 genotypes are a one to two to one ratio, and the F2 phenotypes are a three to one ratio. Okay, if you want more practice on this or you want me to spend more time going over this, please send me a message in Remind, okay, if there's any confusion here. This is a recap to show you that whenever you are crossing two heterozygous individuals and you are looking at a single trait, so meaning a monohybrid cross, the resulting offspring genotype ratio will be one to two to one. Okay, the homozygous dominant to the heterozygous to the homozygous recessive, and the phenotype ratio will be three to one. Now notice this is only if you are crossing two heterozygous individuals. If you cross homozygous with heterozygous or homozygous with another homozygous, the ratios are different. Okay, but if I ask you the expected genotype or phenotype ratio for crossing two heterozygous individuals with a single trait, these are the answers. Okay, so I just want you to practice this and kind of show me that you understood what I was kind of drawing out or saying so far. So we get to our first Remind the App question. What this means is I want you to stop right now, take a picture of this slide, okay? I then want you to answer this question 
and send me the picture of this slide and your answers in the Remind app, okay? Don't go any further until you've done that because otherwise you will forget. And keep in mind, participating in these Remind app questions is part of your grade. Now also keep in mind, whether you are right or wrong does not affect your grade. This is simply for me to help see that you are following along and kind of track your, your progress in the course, okay? So please do not cheat on this, okay? Students who cheat in my class, you fail my course. This, you are not getting graded on whether you're right or wrong. So there is no point in cheating. I don't want to know how your friends do the answer or how the internet does the answer. I want to know that you are understanding this so that you get it correct when it comes time for the exam. Okay, so what I want you to do is we are looking at plant height. I'm going to cross two parents based on plant height. Now with plant height, the dominant allele is capital T. For tall and the recessive allele is lowercase t for short. Now we are looking at a single trait, plant height. So keep in mind each organism that you write out should have two alleles, one that they got from one parent, one that they got from the other parent. Now instead of doing the whole P1, F1, F2, I'm simply having you cross two individuals. The first individual is homozygous dominant, so I want you to translate what that means and write out that parent's alleles. Then I want you to write out parent two, who is heterozygous for height. And with those two parents, I want you to make a Punnett square and show me the four possible offspring. I then want you to write out the genotype and phenotype ratio, okay, based on those four possible offspring. So again, if you have any trouble, if you don't understand what's going on, you can simply say that. You can send me a picture of this slide and say, I'm completely lost, can you help me solve this? And I will, okay? If you know how to solve it, then send me a picture of that, okay? Again, this is for me to help figure out whether or not you know, you need further explanations and to kind of help you along. This is not being graded uh, whether you're right or wrong, okay? So now through Mendel's monohybrid crosses, he developed three postulates, okay? Three, three ideas he came up with about inheritance. The first one is that unit factors are found in pairs, okay? That's basically what we've been saying. You can circle the word factors and replace it with the term alleles. He was basically talking about alleles and didn't know it. So for each trait, for a particular trait, you have a pair of alleles, one that you got from mom, one that you got from dad. Now, when we are looking at these monohybrid crosses, he discovered dominance and recessiveness, which we've also been talking about, meaning that when you have two unlike factors, okay, which is the heterozygous genotype, you have two different alleles for a trait, you will see the dominant one. Okay, You will not see the recessive one. It gets masked or covered up. The last thing he showed was segregation, and segregation of alleles basically means that when you form your sex cells, so when a parent is forming either sperm or eggs, then the pair of alleles for each trait will separate randomly so that the offspring will get one allele for each trait randomly at an equal likelihood. Okay, so the last thing I want you to know about the monohybrid cross is that you can do a test cross, okay? I want you to know what that term means, why it's done, you know, and what exactly is done. So when we say test cross, think about it. You're doing a monohybrid cross. You're looking at a single trait. When you see a dominant looking organism for that trait, so for instance, pea pod color, we said yellow is dominant. If you see a yellow pea pod, well, you know that it has the dominant, the, the dominant allele, but you don't know whether it's homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant. That yellow pea pod that is dominant looking could be hiding 
or masking a recessive allele. So the purpose of a test cross is to determine whether or not a dominant looking organism is fully homozygous dominant, meaning for that trait it only has dominant alleles, or is it heterozygous, meaning it is hiding or masking a recessive allele. How do you do this? Well, for a test cross, you always cross the dominant looking organism with a homozygous recessive organism for that trait. So if we are looking at pea pod color, okay, a test cross, you would wanna know if the yellow dominant pea pod is homozygous or heterozygous genotype. So what would you do? You would cross it with the recessive green pea pod plant. Okay? And you would look to see what kind of offspring it has. If you only see the dominant color in the offspring, you only see yellow offspring in that test cross, that tells you your dominant organism was homozygous. If you see a mixture, some dominant looking, some suddenly recessive looking, that tells you your organism, your dominant looking organism was heterozygous. It was hiding a recessive allele. Okay, so a test cross is to determine the genotype of a dominant looking organism by crossing it with a recessive, a fully recessive organism for that trait. If all of the offspring look dominant, you have a homozygous dominant organism. If some look dominant and suddenly some of the offspring look recessive, that tells you that that dominant organism was actually heterozygous. Okay, if you have any questions, please contact me in Remind. The next type of cross that Gregor Mendel looked into is the dye hybrid cross. And whenever you see DI, dye tells you two. So now this is different from the monohybrid cross because now you are looking at two traits at once. So for instance, instead of just looking at the height of the plant, you'll also look at the color of the plant pods as well at the same time. Okay, so you're looking at two traits instead of one. You can track this with a Punnett square, which I'm going to show you in the next slides, but it's a bit more complex than our little tiny monohybrid Punnett squares. And ultimately, what Mendel was trying to do with the dye hybrid was to distinguish between two hypotheses. One was independent assortment of alleles, and the second was dependent assortment of alleles. And you'll see that in the picture in the next slide. But basically, the difference between these hypotheses is he wanted to know when you're looking at two traits and then a parent is making their sex cells, okay, you already know for each trait that parent must give half of their alleles, so one allele per trait, okay? So when you're looking at two traits at once, they have to give one allele for the first trait and one allele for the second trait into their uh, gamete, their sex cell. In independent assortment hypotheses, you would say, okay, I hypothesize that whichever allele goes into the gamete is random. Dominant alleles do not have to stay with dominant alleles. The first allele of trait one does not have to stay with the first allele of trait two. Okay, so independent assortment means that the alleles for each trait randomly go into the gametes independent of each other. Whereas dependent assortment would mean that certain alleles are sticking together. So for instance, the you could only pass on the dominant allele of trait one with the dominant allele of trait two. Okay, so he did the dihybrid cross to see which result he ended up seeing. Ultimately, the final phenotypic ratio he saw was a nine to three to three to one phenotype for a dihybrid cross of two heterozygous organisms. Okay, so they're heterozygous for trait one, heterozygous for trait two, meaning they have for trait one, a dominant and recessive allele, for trait two, a dominant and recessive allele. And ultimately he saw a nine to three to three to one phenotype, 
which I abbreviated here, means nine were dominant looking for trait one and dominant looking for trait two. Three of them were dominant looking for trait one, but recessive looking for trait two. Three of the possible offspring were recessive for trait one and dominant for trait two, and one out of the 16 will be recessive, recessive. So recessive for both traits. You can see this in the next pictures. Okay, so right here shows his hypothesis of independent assortment versus the hypothesis of dependent assortment. So independent meaning the, the alleles for the different traits can go into gametes randomly, not sticking together in a certain way, whereas dependent would have meant that certain alleles have to stay together. Ultimately, he saw the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotype of the F2 offspring, which you see down here at the bottom or you see in this Punnett square here, meaning he saw a lot of variety in the offspring versus over here, if they were dependent, he would have gotten the same result as the monohybrid cross, a 3 to 1 phenotype. So this result showed which hypothesis is true. In dihybrids, independent assortment was shown true. Okay, so circle star highlight independent assortment and write down that if you do a dihybrid cross of two heterozygous individuals, you expect to see a nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio. Okay, it disproved the dependent assortment hypothesis. So you'll go more into the details of doing all of these kinds of crosses once you take genetics, but I want to give you a quick demo of how exactly you would set up your dihybrid Punnett square because it might kind of help you understand the concept a little more. So dihybrid, okay, that means, sorry, sometimes my handwriting's a little sloppy on the screen. Uh, dihybrid, that means you're looking at two traits. So the two traits we're going to look at in this example is height and color. Okay, height and color. Sorry, it deletes it. Height and color, and so each organism, you'll have a parent one, and a parent two, and each one will have the same genotype because you're crossing two hybrids in this example, okay? Dihybrid, two hybrids, heterozygous. So for each parent, when you do a dihybrid cross, remind yourself you're looking at two traits. So always separate into the two traits. The first trait is height for the genotype, and you should have two alleles for each trait. So the height allele, that parent is a hybrid heterozygous for height, meaning they have one tall, one short allele. Then you draw out the second trait, okay? The second trait we said is color, okay? And so you should have two alleles for that trait as well. So it's going to have a capital dominant allele, which we saw in previous slides as yellow Y, and then a lowercase, because again, it's heterozygous. So as you can see in this example, this parent is two different traits, height and color. Each trait gets two alleles, one from each parent, and it's a hybrid, so each of those alleles is different. Parent two will be the same because parent two is also a hybrid, so parent two will have capital T, lowercase t for trait one, and then capital Y, lowercase y for trait two. So any dihybrid organism should have four alleles, two for trait one, two for trait two, okay? Then you would set up a giant Punnett square, okay? Giant Punnett square, I'm not even gonna show all of the individual uh, squares for you, but basically what you would do is each parent gets a side, okay? And you're writing the gametes, 
Actually, I'm going to erase that because it's a little too close to the other uh, drawings that I made for you. So I want to separate this so that you don't get it mixed up. And we're going to draw out the giant Punnett square. Like I said, you put one parent's gametes on one side. So let's start with parent one. Again, because it's a dihybrid, they're both going to be the same gametes. And what you do is you draw their possible gametes. Now, whenever you draw a dihybrid, okay, keep in mind, if you made your gametes, your sex cells for a dihybrid, then your, let's say, sperm sex cell should have one allele for each trait because you're only passing on half your genetics to your organism. So what I always do is I make note for myself, you have trait one and then trait two. So trait one allele from parent number one can either be a capital T or a lowercase t. So you first put, let's say, capital T. Now for that gamete, they need one allele from trait two to pass on because you're only passing on half your genetics. So either a capital Y or a lowercase y. Let's say capital Y. Then for the next gamete that they can make, they could pass on a capital T for height, but this time, what's the other option for color? Lowercase y. Then you do height, they can pass on a lowercase t with one capital allele for trait two, or they can pass on a lowercase t with the other option, lowercase y. Okay, so basically what you're doing for each gamete that you make for that parent, you're taking one allele from height and then putting it with one allele for color until you have made all four options. You then on the other side do the same thing for parent number two. Okay, parent number two can have a capital T or it could pass on a lowercase t. It can pass on a or sorry, the pen was sighing, a capital Y or a lowercase y, a capital Y or a lowercase y. And again, anytime you're doing a dihybrid cross and you're drawing things out, you can separate it based on trait one and trait two. So for the gametes, you should have one allele for each trait. Then what you do when you're filling in the squares is you put together trait one should have two alleles, one from parent one, one from parent two for trait one, then two alleles for trait two. Parent one's trait two allele and parent two's trait two allele. Okay, so all of the inside squares, the offspring squares, any of these should have four alleles because that's a whole organism. Whereas the outside squares should have two alleles, okay? Now you can practice by filling in all of those squares and if you wanna send me a picture of it to see if you did it correctly, feel free to, okay? Students sometimes have trouble with dihybrids, but again, if you think of it as trait one and trait two and remind yourself that each full organism has to have two alleles for trait one, two alleles for trait two, and then when they produce gametes, you're passing on half that information. It will help you kind of not get too confused with dihybrids. Now with dihybrid crosses, you can also do a test cross like we did with monohybrid crosses. Now again, anytime you see the term test cross, what that means is you have an organism that is dominant looking. So in the case of a dihybrid cross, it's dominant looking for two different traits. What you then do at a test cross is you cross that dominant looking organism with a fully recessive organism.
So in this case, fully recessive for both traits. And the purpose is to figure out from their offspring the genotype of the dominant looking organism. So for instance, is it heterozygous or is it fully homozygous dominant? And just like the monohybrid, the way the results tell you that is if you do a test cross and all of the offspring look dominant, then that organism was homozygous dominant for both traits. Okay, so make sure you write down that anytime you do a test cross and you see all of the offspring look dominant, that tells you that the organism in question was homozygous dominant. Whereas if you see a variety of offspring, so you see the recessive traits coming out too in the offspring, that tells you that the dominant looking organism was heterozygous. Okay, make sure you're clear on both options. Now, as I mentioned earlier, since Mendel was the father of genetics, at the time that he was doing these experiments and getting these results, he did not actually know about DNA or chromosomes yet. But once other scientists who kind of built off of his postulates and his ideas started to really look into genetics with more modernized technology and chromosomes were discovered, it was found that the chromosomes did match up with Mendel's original postulates. So basically it was found that alleles did uh, end up being pairs and that segregation was randomized where you know these alleles would separate during gamete formation into uh, a random pattern and that it was independent assortment where you know the inheritance of certain alleles was not connected to other alleles okay they were kind of dispersed randomly so please note that even though we keep talking about traits and and these letters you know capital T lowercase t that ultimately the true inheritance is through chromosome inheritance. And I want you to circle star highlight that last one, independent assortment, and note that that is what leads to genetic variation that we're kind of gonna see once we go into the details of evolution and, and biodiversity later in this course. So now we're going to go beyond the basic Mendelian genetics and go into some extensions of Mendelian genetics. The first extension of Mendelian genetics is what we call incomplete or partial dominance. And the meaning of that is, I want you to think of it this way. There are two alleles Okay, so in the case of this example, you have the dominant red and the recessive looking white. But in incomplete or partial dominance, neither one gets true dominance over the other. Okay, so partial meaning you do not see either one in its full color. Instead, you get a blending of colors. Okay, so when you see a blending of color, and neither of the, the alleles is getting true dominance. We call that incomplete or partial dominance. And by blending of colors, I mean, if I tell you that a red and a white flower make pink flowers, red and white making pink would be incomplete dominance, okay? Red and blue flowers making purple flowers, okay? Getting a third new color, that's incomplete or partial dominance. Dominance. And I want you to take a look at the F2 generation and write down in your notes that the F2 generation of incomplete dominance, you have the genotype ratio is the same as the phenotype ratio. So if you remember in regular monohybrid, we saw a three to one phenotype. Okay, three of the four offspring looked dominant, one out of the four looked recessive, and the genotype ratio was one to two to one. So the genotype and phenotype ratios were different. In incomplete dominance, you notice that each genotype 
produces its own particular color. So you get the genotype and the phenotypic ratio being one to two to one. In co-dominance, on the other hand, I want you to underline the CO of co or circle co and think co-captains, okay? And in this case, both of the alleles show full dominance when you're looking at phenotypes, okay? So you can think of it as in the, in the offspring, you completely see. So again, going with that CO theme, co-dominants are like co-captains. You completely see both of them. So in the case of red and white alleles for flowers, with co-dominance, instead of blending together, you see both colors in their full, completely dominant form. So you see speckling, you see some white, and you see some red. In this case of the cow, you see brown and you see white, okay? So incomplete partial dominance, you saw a third new color, that's the blended version of the two colors. Whereas in co-dominance, you see both colors together in kind of a spotted speckled pattern, okay? Just like with incomplete dominance, in the case of co-dominance, you also have genotype ratio being the same as phenotype ratio, okay? So you would have one to two to one, but now instead of red, pink, and white, you would have red, speckled, and white as your three possible phenotypes, and three genotypes would then be homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive. Okay, so make sure I can describe the offspring that you're seeing. So if I say red and blue making purple, you should be able to tell me that that's an example of incomplete dominance, whereas red and, and blue having speckled, spotted flowers, that would be co-dominance. Okay, if you have any questions, please contact me in the Remind app. Now, eventually it was discovered that not every gene has just two allele forms, meaning two alternate forms. So it's not always just gonna be, is it tall or is it short? For some traits, the genes actually have more than two allele forms, and that's called multiple allele inheritance. The big example that I want you to remember for this is ABO blood typing. So basically the alleles and genes that determine what blood type your body has. When we look at blood typing, there are three alleles that ultimately determine what blood type you have. There's the IA allele, the IB allele, and the lowercase i allele. I A and I B alleles are co-dominant, meaning you see them in their full, you know, complete expression if they are present, whereas lowercase i is recessive. Now, what's important about each of these alleles is that they produce a particular product on the outer membrane of your blood cells. If you have the I A allele present at all, then your blood cells will have an A antigen or a little A protein on their outer membranes. I call antigens basically name tags of cells. It's a little polysaccharide that will, you know, basically show the, the body what you are. Now, the IB allele, that gives you the B name tag. On your, red, uh, on your red blood cells. IA does not have any special tag on it, okay? So depending on which ones of these, these uh, alleles you have determines what is found on the outside of your blood cells. Now notice they're codominant. So if you have, let's say, two of the same one, okay, I have two IA alleles here for the first genotype, well, then that is just a blood type. If both are present, then you have both in the, the phenotype. So you would call that a B blood, okay? Here you have just B present, so that's B blood. Anytime the lowercase i is next to one of the dominant ones, it is masked 
so you only see the dominant one. So here, IA, lowercase i, that yields A blood type. IB, lowercase i, yields B blood type. And then two lowercase i's yields O blood type. Now what O blood type means is that it has no antigen on the outside of that, that cell, no special name tag, which means that if you put O blood in anyone else's body, their body won't realize that there is something foreign there. That's why O blood is the universal donor. It can be given to anyone without causing a reaction. Whereas if you give a B blood, anyone other than an AB body, then the recipient will then realize, hey, this has A name tags that aren't supposed to be here, or it has B name tags that aren't supposed to be here, and it will attack, okay? So you can only give AB blood to someone who is AB, and you can give O blood to anyone. Now, what's good about AB is that because they have both antigens, both name tags on their blood cells, their body does not produce antibodies against either A or B because they recognize that as their own. So AB can take blood from anyone, okay, without their blood causing a problem, without their blood fighting it, okay? So AB is the universal recipient, circle that, AB, and write universal recipient. They can take blood from anyone because they have no antibodies toward A or B, as you can see here, whereas type O is the universal donor. They can give to anyone, but they can only get O back because if you try to put, let's say, A blood in an O body, well, they have anti-A antibodies that will attack the A. If you try to put B blood or AB blood, well, they're anti-B antibodies will attack, okay? So when you read a chart like this, remember antibodies attack, okay? Whereas the antigens are the name tags that they have. Okay, if you have any questions about blood typing, feel free to send me a message in the Remind app. Just make sure you know that it's a form of multiple allele inheritance and know what those alleles are and represent. Now, in addition to multiple alleles affecting what you see, a lot of times phenotypes are often affected by more than one gene. So it's usually a gene pathway that leads to the final thing you see. And there are two terms regarding this that I want you to know the meaning of and the significance of. So the first one is gene interaction. And what gene interaction means is that there may be several genes influencing a particular characteristic. Okay, so several genes influencing a particular characteristic. And this is the opposite of pleiotropy. I want you to circle pleiotropy and write that that is when a single gene has multiple phenotypic effects. Okay, so gene interaction is multiple genes influencing a phenotype whereas pleiotropy is a single gene having multiple phenotypic effects. The other term I want you to know is epistasis. An epist epistasis is when a mutation in one gene masks any changes that might have occurred in another gene or in any other genes in that pathway. So basically it means genes in an earlier part of a pathway tend to be epistatic to the genes later in that pathway. So when we're looking at the example here, this figure here, okay, gene A is epistatic to genes B and C, okay, and B is epistatic to gene C, so there, these are early in the pathway. This is later in the pathway leading to red, red pigment. And the reason why they're epistatic to the later ones is that, for instance, if there is a mutation in gene A, well, now you see a lack of red pigment. 
But once you see that lack of red pigment, you can't tell if there were also any changes that occurred in B or C, because ultimately you, you're not getting the end product anyway at this point. Okay? Uh, another example of this is this figure here where once you see that there's baldness, you don't know if there was any mutation in the gene for blonde hair or red hair, because all you see is the lack of hair. Okay, so it's masking any kind of mutations that may exist in the other genes. Okay, so epistasis is when a mutation in one gene masks any changes that may have occurred in any other genes. So the last part of the extension of Mendelian genetics that I want to talk about is sex-linked inheritance versus autosomal inheritance. Now, before we mention that, we have to get into briefly sex determination and linkage. So basically, it's the idea that you have two sex chromosomes. So it's a pair of sex chromosomes, one that you inherited from mom, one that you inherited from dad. The sex chromosome can either be an X, which you see has a whole lot of genes, or a small Y. If you have an XX pair of sex chromosomes, then you will basically have secondary sex characteristics that are more feminine rather than the, the classical masculine. So for instance, higher pitched voice, breast formation or increased breast formation, and things like reduced hair growth. Whereas if you have the XY pair of sex chromosomes, then the Y ends up yielding secondary sex characteristics that are more traditionally masculine. So the increased muscle formation and deeper voice, things like that. Okay, this does not have anything to do with gender identification. Okay, this is strictly speaking the chromosomal level of, of enzymes, hormone production, and secondary sex characteristics. Now, the reason I mention that is when we talk about trait inheritance, certain traits are inherited in an autosomal manner, whereas others are sex-linked. And what that means is sex-linked are traits where the alleles are found on either the X or the Y chromosome. Usually sex-linked are X-linked, meaning that their mutations found on the X chromosome, but there are a few cases of Y mutations as well. Now, in order to determine if a trait is autosomal or sex-linked, what you do is you perform a reciprocal cross, meaning that you swap the gender of the parental flies. So in this first cross, or this first part of a reciprocal cross, you have the female is wild type, aka normal red color eyes, whereas the male is the one that has the white eyed mutation. You then perform the same cross of a white eyed and red eyed fly, but now you swap the genders. So in the first cross, the male was the one with the white eye mutation, whereas the female in the, the second cross now has the white eye mutation. You then take a look at the offspring. If both crosses produce the same offspring, so for instance, if the first and the second cross had all red-eyed flies, that would tell you that the trait is autosomal. If you do reciprocal crosses where you swap the gender of the parents, so you swap which fly, which gender has the mutation, and now you see a different ratio of the offspring, that tells you it's sex-linked, okay? So how do you determine if a trait is autosomal or sex-linked? The answer is you, you perform a reciprocal cross where one half of the crosses have the female with the mutation and one half have the male with the mutation. And you see if the offspring of the two different crosses end up the same. If you see differences in the offspring, 
then that tells you that it was sex linked. Now, when we talk about autosomal and sex linked inheritances or dominant and recessive trait inheritances, I want to point out that you can use pedigree charts to represent the different forms of inheritance. Now, I am not going to make you learn every aspect of pedigree charts. I'm not going to make you look at a pedigree chart and figure out whether it's autosomal or recessive, a dominant, you know, X linked, any of that because that's what we do in the upper level genetics courses. Instead, I simply want you to know that pedigree charts are a way to show inheritance, and I want you to know how to read them, meaning what do each of the symbols mean? When you see a square on a pedigree chart, that represents a male. When you see a circle, I want you to know that that represents a female. When you see the line between these two, and another line coming down, that means that these two organisms, these two individuals have been crossed. These are now each of their offspring. So this male, this female reproduce and they had three offspring. One is male, two are female, okay? Square versus circle. I also want you to know that when you look at a pedigree chart and you see a filled in shape, it is filled in because it means that that individual is affected, meaning it has the mutation or the disease that ha is being represented in that pedigree chart, okay? Not filled in means it's perfectly healthy. If, however, you see half and half, okay, half filled in, that tells you that that individual is a carrier, okay? So they may not show the, the illness or they may have a weakened form of it, but they are carrying that mutant, that mutant allele and are capable of passing it on to their offspring. Okay, so you don't need to look at a pedigree chart and tell me what form of inheritance it is, but you should be able to if I ask you what a circle represents on a pedigree chart, what a square, if it's fully filled in, if it's half filled in, that I want you to know. And this last picture of pedigree charts is to show you the X-linked inheritance. Okay, so you could take a look at the previous ones that were autosomal, meaning that they are mutations that are on any of the other chromosomes, not X or Y, versus these pictures on this slide, which is inheritance on X chromosome. So the mutation is found on the X chromosome. So you'll notice certain patterns uh, in terms of the, you know, whether the uh, male parent has the disease, whether the female, and how swapping them can change the results. Okay? If you have any questions or concerns, as always, contact me in the Remind app. Now we are going to jump forward, move away from the father of genetics, Mendel, and move on to the specifics and details of DNA, which happens to be my favorite biomolecule. Now, when we talk about DNA, DNA is an example of the biomolecule called nucleic acids. So you should remember from your previous bio classes that the biomolecules, the four main biomolecules, are proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. Now, these biomolecules are usually big polymers made up of a whole bunch of smaller monomers, meaning smaller subunits. Nucleic acids, their smaller monomer subunits are nucleotides, and we're going to go over that in the upcoming slides. Now, they have very specific functions within the cells. Okay? The two examples of nucleic acids I want you to know are DNA and RNA. Okay, so DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, whereas RNA is ribonucleic acid. And some of the differences that you'll notice between them DNA has the double helix structure, whereas RNA is a single helix. And as we go through the procedures of transcription, translation, you'll have a better understanding of why that's significant. Now, when we talk about these structures, DNA we consider the genetic material of an organism. And in the case of humans, that genetic 
material is found in the nucleus of our cells, okay? And I know whenever I mention a cell, everyone just shouts out mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. But yes, DNA is very important and it's found in the nucleus of our cells. But things like bacteria, they don't have that nucleus, but they still have DNA, okay? Now, when we look at RNA, on the other hand, it's single-stranded, and this will be involved in the assembly of proteins, and that will be the process of translation that we talk about in a later lecture. Okay, so we're going to go into more detail throughout this lecture as well as the next lecture. Now, when we look at DNA and RNA, I've already mentioned part of the difference between them, but I want you to know these general basic differences between DNA and RNA. The first difference that you see here is the sugar component of each of these is slightly different, and that's how they get their name, so deoxyribonucleic acid, because of the deoxyribosugar of DNA, versus ribonucleic acid having the ribosugar. We've already mentioned double versus single stranded. I also want you to note that when we talk about the nitrogen bases, the letters that you have for DNA sequences versus RNA sequences, DNA you will find thymine, whereas RNA you will find uracil. And as we mentioned already, DNA codes for RNA, whereas RNA then codes for protein. And under these, I want you to note this procedure, DNA coding for RNA is called transcription, whereas the procedure of RNA coding for protein is called translation. Make sure you know those terms. Now, when we look at the structure of DNA and RNA, we've kind of mentioned this a little bit already. So both of them are made up of many nucleotides linked together. So the nucleotides being the monomers that make up these polymers. Now, each nucleotide, when you look at a nucleotide, you will notice that it has three parts to it. It has a phosphate group, a sugar group, and a nitrogen-containing base. The sugar group, if it's DNA, will be deoxyribose. If it's RNA, this sugar group will be ribose. The nitrogen bases are the letters that you will see in later slides as well. In the case of DNA, it's A, T, G, and C, okay, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, which again you'll have written out later on, whereas RNA has A, U instead of T, and then G and C, so adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. The linkage between them is a phosphodiester bond, and you end up with what they call a phosphate sugar backbone, making up the, the outer part of the, the helices. And then in the center, the rungs of the ladder, if you want to kind of visualize DNA as a ladder, those are the nitrogen bases. Now, when we're looking at the structure of those nucleic acids, again, the nitrogen bases, so that you can write them out with proper spelling, in DNA, it's adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, whereas in RNA, it's A, G, C, and then uracil instead of thymine. Make sure you circle star highlight that fact because that, that will be important when we talk about transcription and translation later on. I also want you to know the complementary pairs, meaning the nitrogen bases that like to find each other and link up with each other when they are in cells. So either the two strands, the two halves of DNA wanting to be close together, or RNA being attracted to a DNA sequencer or another RNA sequence. As I always say, single strands of nucleic acids, they're single, they're clingy, and they want to find their party, partner. And there's no Tinder for nucleic acids, so they have to find their complementary pairs. When it comes to complementary pairs, A will only bond or be attracted to T. And in the case of if RNA is involved, then it's U instead of T. Okay, so A, T, A, U, those are the complementary pairs. And then the other set of complementary pairs are G and C. So guanine is attracted to cytosine and wants to bind to it. 
whereas adenine is attracted to thymine or uracil. And the trick to remember which is pairing with which is to kind of use whatever celebrity you can think of that will help remember you, you know, these, these pairings. For instance, a lot of people say George Clooney to remember that GC likes to stick together, whereas the remainder AT or AU will stick together. And this is going to be important in later lessons, so make sure to circle star highlight this information. Okay, so now that you're all experts on the structure of nucleic acids, we can go into the details of the processes that they're involved in, which include things like DNA replication, transcription, translation. Now, before we get into those details, I want you to circle star highlight the term central dogma. Okay, the central dogma of biology is DNA to RNA to protein. And someone online made this very nice representation of these processes. So the central dogma is DNA to RNA, which is through the process of transcription, okay, which you'll hear as gene expression in our later lectures. And then RNA to protein, which is the process of translation. Okay, again, circle star highlight this information of the central dogma as it usually comes back in later lessons as well as on exams. So now before we get into the steps of transcription and translation of this central dogma, we're first gonna take a look at DNA in more detail, specifically DNA replication. In order to pass genetic information onto its offspring, an organism must make a copy of its DNA. The process of copying DNA is called DNA replication. During replication, each strand of the parental DNA serves as a template in the creation of new DNA. Because each newly synthesized DNA molecule is made up of one parental strand and one new strand, DNA replication is described as semi-conservative. One strand in each molecule is conserved, while the other strand is newly replicated. Okay, so that was the first video, which is a general overview video. And now we're going to go into a little more detail with the next video. And please keep in mind that today, any of the processes we go through, any enzymes that we start to talk about, which you're going to see in the next video, you have to be very comfortable knowing the names as well as the functions of all enzymes that we mentioned today. And please make sure to keep each of the processes separate because uh, one of the biggest things that I see happen with this chapter with students when it comes time for exams is that students tend to lose points by simply mixing up the different processes and accidentally not reading the question carefully or putting the wrong enzymes with the wrong process. Okay, so we're gonna go into a little more detail now. In many organisms, the two DNA polymerases responsible for replicating the leading and lagging strands are linked together by connector proteins. To make this possible, cells take advantage of the flexibility of DNA. The leading strand is synthesized continuously toward the replication fork in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Since the leading strand is synthesized continuously, it only needs one RNA primer to start the process. Since DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing DNA molecule, the lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously away from the replication fork in the five prime to three prime direction. The DNA of the lagging strand is synthesized in pieces called Okazaki fragments, which consist of about 1,000 nucleotides. 
Each Okazaki fragment requires its own RNA primer. So now, as you saw in the video, DNA replication is considered a semi-conservative replication. Okay, so ask yourself, what did they say that that means? Semi-conservative. So semi means partially. Conservative means you're keeping something the same. So in semi-conservative replication, if you look at the figure on the right here, you have a double-stranded parent DNA, and we're going to be making two copies from that single DNA. So what happens is the double strands on zip, and each of those original strands becomes a template, which is part of the new daughter strands. So each of these two daughter strands has one half of that original molecule which is why it's considered semi-conservative, because it has kept some of the original molecule. Now, important question to ask yourself is when does a cell need to replicate its DNA? And I want you to put stars or circle or highlight this question, because this you will see again. Think about it. When would a cell want to double all of the genes that it currently has? Well, before mitosis, before it splits, right? Because if that one cell is now going to become two cells, if it did not double its DNA first, then each of those cells would have how many genes? Only half, right? And every time a cell split or divided, each time it would end up with fewer and fewer of the DNA that it's supposed to have. So that's why every cell needs to replicate its DNA before cell division, before mitosis. And what we usually see that referred to as is S phase or synthesis phase of interphase in, in the cell cycle. Okay, but the key thing to remember here is before mitosis, before cell division. Okay? Now, like I mentioned before, what's really important when you go through any of these genetic processes is to really be comfortable with the enzymes involved. And if you know all of the enzymes and what they're doing, in what order that they're doing that, you then understand the process completely. So on this slide, I mapped out the various enzymes that are involved in DNA replication in the order that they're involved. So the first two that you see here are gyrase and helicase, okay? Gyrase and helicase. Gyrase, you may remember, we mentioned in lecture number one, and I said that it would come back. So gyrase, what that does is it undoes the coiling of that DNA. Because remember, you have that DNA all coiled up to become very tight and fit into the small cell. So now if you're going to replicate it, you need to first uncoil it. Okay, But it is still double-stranded at this point. What then unzips or denatures it into single strands is helicase. Okay, so gyrase uncoiled the DNA, and now helicase unzips it or denatures it into single strands. Now, if a cell just unzipped that double-stranded DNA into two single strands, what's it naturally going to want to do? naturally going to want to stick back together, right? Because those are complement strands. They match each other. They stick together. So in order to prevent that sticking together or resealing of the double strands, what's called single-stranded binding protein will stick all along the single strands and coat those single strands so that they stay separated 
so that the primase and DNA polymerase can then take care of replication. Now we're going to go over the details of primase, DNA polymerase, RNASH, and ligase in the next slides. But so far, keep in mind, gyrase on coils, helicase then on zips to single strands, and SSB coats the single strands so that they don't stick back together. Then we get to our next enzymes. The next enzymes to think about are DNA polymerase and primase. Now, DNA polymerase, whenever you hear polymerase, Think of enzymes that build nucleic acids. So if it's a DNA polymerase, it builds or puts together DNA strands. If it's RNA polymerase, then it builds RNA. Now, DNA polymerase, it's gonna build DNA strands, but it's not all that great at its job. Okay. It has some limitations, specifically that it can only build in one direction, known as the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. That's simply how we, um, how we label DNA. So figure if you were to say that from the top to bottom of something, that's the same thing as saying from 5' prime to 3' prime. Okay? Now the other limitation that DNA polymerase has is it cannot start new strands. So it can't build a DNA strand from scratch. It needs to have what's called a three prime OH of a previous nucleotide to build off of, to stick the new base to, okay? So for instance, if you think of DNA, remember in lecture one we reviewed that DNA has a whole bunch of different nitrogen bases. They can be A, T, C, or G. So what we're saying here is you cannot have DNA polymerase start from scratch. It would need at least one A, T, G, or C to stick the next letter base to, okay? To build that strand. So, you have to ask yourself, well, what's necessary to compensate for these limitations? Because clearly, DNA polymerase builds new DNA, but how does it do that if it can't start from scratch? Well, what's needed is called primase, okay? Prime okay, so what's needed to correct for those limitations is primase, okay? So that's how you spell primase. Primase is an RNA polymerase, and as you can see in later slides, RNA polymerase is a rock star, okay? It is fantastic at its job, unlike DNA polymerase. So now, what primase is able to do is it makes a whole bunch of little RNA primers, which now can be the start site for DNA polymerase. Now, we're not going to go into all of the details involved in that process, but just be aware that when primase makes these little RNA primers as a start site for DNA polymerase, DNA has two strands. One of them is the leading strand, which will only need one RNA primer. Okay? The lagging strand, however, because of the orientation that it's in, that one's going to require many little RNA primers as that strand gets built. What I mean by an RNA primer is simply a few bases of RNA. And if you remember, three of those bases will be the same as DNA, A, G, and C. But one of them will be different, okay? So this RNA primer will have U instead of T, okay? Now, this is important to think about because now you have to ask yourself, after DNA synthesis has occurred, what's our problem now? Well, each of those new DNA strands have these little segments of RNA. And as we just mentioned, RNA has uracil in it. And it doesn't have any thymine 
So that's going to be a problem, right? You don't have proper DNA code in those little segments. So the last part of DNA replication is to fix this problem. So what you need is pole 1, RNASH, and ligase. Okay, pole 1, RNASH, and ligase. So what happens here, pole 1 and RNASH will degrade the primers. Okay, so these RNA primers get broken away and removed by PO1 and RNase-H. Then what happens is PO1 also replaces the removed RNA with DNA sequences, with DNA bases. Okay, so now with A's, T's, G's, and C's. And then the last step is ligase will seal any little gaps in the backbone, okay? So now at the end, you have beautifully repaired DNA that is 100% DNA, no more RNA present, okay? So just to review that process one more time, you have pole one and RNA-H degrading primers. You then have pole one replacing those removed RNA bases with DNA bases, and ligase will simply seal up any of the gaps in the backbone. Okay, so now in the next slide, what I'll do is review each of these enzymes with their function, so that just in case you missed anything or had trouble writing it down on time, you'll have it to visualize and to take down in your notes. Okay, so let's recap that one more time. The way DNA replication works is, first you have the gyrase, and the gyrase uncoils that big ball of DNA. Then the helicase comes along, and that unzips the double strands, so that there are now two exposed single strands. Then SSB comes along and coats both of those single strands so that they don't instantly stick back together. Now that those strands are nice and separated, primase can come along, and that's the one that we said is a rock star. It's an RNA polymerase that will start off our new strands, but it's starting off as RNA bases, just a few, usually about six to nine bases. And now that those bases are there, DNA polymerase, which has its limitations, now has something to build off of as a starting point. So now DNA polymerase can take over and build the rest of the DNA strands, putting together those A's, T's, G's, and C's. Once that's complete and we have our two new DNA strands, there's currently a problem, right? After DNA synthesis, there's that problem that there are still some RNA bases in that DNA strand because the primers are there. So now PO1 and RNA-H will degrade or remove any of those RNA bases and pole one, which is a polymerase, will now build or replace those RNA bases with DNA bases. The last thing to happen is ligase basically cleans up the, the last minute messes and will reseal any little gaps that are currently in the backbone of the DNA. And boom, there you have the bacteria has two new DNA strands which are semi-conservative. They are made up of one original DNA strand and one newly built DNA strand. And all of this occurred before mitosis, okay? Before the cell needs to divide. So that after mitosis, each cell will have the proper amount of DNA, okay? If you have 
any trouble with any of the enzymes or any of the DNA replication process, just send me a remind message and I'll give you a bit more information. Again, this is meant as a chapter in microbiology that is supposed to be review, but I understand that some students may not have had this before. So feel free to ask as many questions as you like. You are never bothering me. Now, even though replicating eukaryotic DNA is very similar to replicating prokaryotic DNA, there does remain a big difference. The problem is, is that bacterial DNA or prokaryotic DNA is a circle, it's a ring. So when you go to degrade and then replace those RNA primers in the DNA sequence, there's always a nucleotide right next to it to serve as a starting point. With eukaryotic DNA, the problem is the DNA is linear, okay? That means that it has ends instead of being circular. So with each DNA replication in eukaryotes, there will be a five prime end where the RNA primer is degraded and it cannot be replaced by polymerase because there's no nucleotide next to it to serve as a starting point. So what eukaryotic DNA needs to make up for that is telomeres, okay? Telomeres. And basically, telomeres are multiple tandem repeats so that there's no unique coding region that ends up lost when you have this shortening with every replication. Instead, that will be part of those multiple non-coding repeats of the telomere lost. Now, unfortunately, most human cells, most human somatic cells do not produce active telomerase to keep making longer and longer telomeres, okay? That means that a lot of human somatic cells, a lot of your human body cells, they do not maintain stable telomere length. Instead, they're constantly shortening the telomeres without them having the enzyme to replace them. That's basically part of the reason why you have aging. There's only a limited number of DNA replications that can occur before you end up losing good cells. Okay, good, sorry, good important sequences in your RNA and DNA. So this is just a visual for you to see that, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that issue of the shortening you know, of DNA with each replication, where there's that segment that's lacking you know, because the primer was, was taken away and not replaced, some organisms have an enzyme called telomerase. So it can continually extend or make long telomeres at the end of that linear DNA. Okay, so then those long telomeres are the only parts of the DNA that end up getting lost with each replication. But again, unfortunately, humans, most of our cells do not have that enzyme telomerase. So although we have telomeres at the end of the DNA, they are limited where we can't keep replacing those lost uh, sequences as they're broken down or lost with each round of replication. Now, sometimes things go wrong during DNA replication, so there are two mechanisms that I want you to know that can help repair if something went wrong in terms of the sequence of the DNA that's been replicated. Now, ultimately, the first one is called the DNA mismatch repair, and that will detect the bulge or distortion, which you can see in this figure here, that occurs when two bases are not with their proper complementary pair, okay? So it basically creates this distortion that this repair system can now detect and fix. And what this system does is it cuts out the wrong base, which whichever base should not be in that particular location. Now the way it determines what exactly is the wrong base that needs to be removed, well think about it. 
you just had this DNA replicated. So now there are two possible culprits of which one, you know, which letter on which strand could be wrong because, you know, two strands make up the DNA. But if you remember, it's semi-conservative. So one of the strands or one of those bases is the original template DNA and one is the new daughter. Now it turns out what happens is the original template has methylation because that occurs later after replication. The new daughter strand or the new daughter uh, bases, they lack methylation. Okay, so that helps this repair system figure out which one needs to be removed because at this point, after DNA replication, the DNA is hemimethylated. Okay, that means that one of the strands has methylation because it was the original DNA, and one of the strands does not have methylation. Hemi means half. Half the DNA has methylation, half does not. The repair system is able to detect that and it's able to then cut out the wrong base and have polymerase 3 fill in the correct base. There is also something called excision repair. An excision repair is known as the cut and patch repair. This one is for recognizing major distortions in DNA. Specifically, it's usually used to repair uh, what you see in the figure here as, for instance, UV damage thymine dimers. Okay, so thymine dimers are created when there's UV exposure. Okay, and then this excision repair will jump in and correct that. So I want you to circle those double T's and make a note on this slide that excision repair, one of the things it does is it repairs thymine dimers, that's D-I-M-E-R-S, and other cross-linked bases uh, from things like UV damage. Now, this system is not considered as sensitive as the mismatch system, but overall the mechanism is very similar in that it basically recognizes the distortion, such as the thymine dimers or cross-linked bases, and it will nick or cut around the dimer and then replace with polymerase to help kind of fill in the gaps that are created. Okay, and then ligase ultimately seals up any nicks of the strand, any break in the, the backbone. Okay, you don't have to know, for instance, UVRC, UVRB, all these, these letters that are on here. Uh, that's all for genetics and molecular courses down the line. For now, just know that these which excision and mismatch repairs exist and the general idea as well as when you would use them. So notice the first one was a mismatch between bases. The second one is for cross-linked bases like thymine dimers from UV damage. That is it for today. As always, feel free to contact me in the Remind app if you have any questions, if there's a slide you want me to go over in more detail, or you kind of want me to help you narrow down your focus, give you practice problems, whatever it is, Feel free to contact me anytime, day or night. I always say I have no life, so you're not interrupting me. Now, please keep in mind, if we met in person, this course is registered as three hours per week. You would have been sitting in the lecture room. Now, I am very nice when it comes to these recordings, so I try to keep them much below the three hour mark. So if you ever think like, wow, that was so much information for today, you know, that was a lot, you have the luxury of during the week, pause the video and resume at a later point. You don't have to watch the whole video at once. Make sure you take careful notes on every slide. But like I said, keep in mind, you would have been in person for three hours worth of time. So keep that in mind if you start thinking, wow, she's just going on, these videos are so long, okay? Again, any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you and have a great day.